All right, uh, it's 6.32 p.m. So I think we should begin in interest of time because we only have 30 minutes. All right, so very good evening to everyone here. Right, welcome to the Communication Around You workshop series. This is actually our very first workshop of the series right, organized by the Department of English, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. My name is uh, Dr. Dennis Tay, and I'm also the program leader of the undergraduate degree program. So I'm very happy to also talk to you about that later on. So today I want to share with you uh, this topic I call it how language betrays our emotions. Now it sounds like a very, it sounds a little bit like a very intriguing topic. So I'm gonna talk more about how actually studying language or linguistics at university is that could be something that you may not have imagined before. You know, it opens up new doors and new perspectives on the role of language in our society. Right, so let's begin by talking very generally about the relationship between language on the one hand and emotions on the other hand. But we all know that there's probably some kind of link between them, right? So you can see, for instance, on the um, on the quotes, you know, by these two famous people on the right hand side, right? Paul Angel is a very famous uh, poet, right, in the previous century. And he says something like, you know, poetry is ordinary language raised to the nth power. Poetry is born with ideas, nerved and blooded with emotions all held together by the delicate, tough skin of words. So very nice, very poetic language. So what he's trying to say is that, you know, language or poetic language can really arouse emotions within us, right? And most of the time, positive emotions, right? And then this lady, Audrey uh, Lorde uh, on the bottom, what she says is something quite different. She says, what you hear in my voice is fury, not suffering, anger, not moral authority. So Audrey was actually like a social activist. And what he, she's saying here is she's voicing out her great displeasure towards some kind of um, uh, social policy at the time that she wanted to protest against, right? So when we look at these two seemingly very, you know, ordinary quotes by famous people, we can learn a few things about the link between language and emotions, right? So first of all, as you can see back to the left-hand side, you know, language can, can arouse very positive emotions, emotions of pleasure, emotions of love, emotions of excitement, right? As Paul says, through poetry. But at the same time, they can also uh, invoke, um, or rather they can also display very negative emotions like fury and anger, as you see at the bottom, right? So that's kind of pretty obvious. And something that's not so obvious is that language and emotions, actually the relationship can also be seen from two perspectives. First one is language comprehension, that means receiving language so when you read a poem when you read poetry like paul was saying you are actually comprehending or receiving the language and that arouses your emotions some, somewhat right and on the other hand emotions are also involved when we produce language in language production like what audrey is saying at the bottom you know when she says that she she's protesting against uh, authorities and things like that she she's actually generating those feelings of anger and fury even as she speaks as well. So in, th in this case, uh, her emotions are tied to the production of language, right? So that's something interesting. And also something even more subtle that you may not have been aware of is that emotions aroused through language can be either volitional and non-volitional. So now if this word volitional is something new to you, it simply means control, right? So emotions aroused through language via language can sometimes be easy to control but sometimes they can be out of control. Like in the case of Audrey, when she says, you know, she's angry, she's furious. Those emotions are negative and they're probably not in the locus entirely of her own personal control. So these are very broad links between language and emotions. And this link actually has many important applications in the real world that uh, as, a as a student of linguistics, right, you can actually get to explore. So the first example is for instance, in a scenario of a lie detector test. So some of you may have seen this kind of picture before, right? So when someone is suspected of doing something wrong, the police interviews them and the police may and proceed to give them, strap this kind of very complicated device onto their bodies. So this is called a polygraph test or a lie detector test, right? So imagine if you are the, the person in the blue shirt. In this situation, you are actually trying to use language to conceal emotions. Assuming that you are guilty, you are actually trying to not let the machine detect it. Right. So how do you, so do you know how the machine works, right? Do you know how the polygraph works? But actually a polygraph works by actually not measuring your language, but measuring your physiological responses to what you are saying. So it measures things like your pulse, your blood pressure, how much you are sweating, 
right? All these things can then later on uh, be used to infer whether you are being overly nervous, overly cautious, and therefore whether you are potentially lying to the police or not, right? So in these kinds of case, uh, cases, the subject is actually trying to conceal his or her true emotions using language. The subject speaks against his true feelings, and the subject is trying to conceal his true feelings. So he's trying to use language to kind of disguise his real feelings. If he killed somebody, he's going to say, no, we didn't do it. And we didn't kill somebody, right? Then he wouldn't be in this position in the first place. Right, so this is one important application, right, in the so-called policing world. And this kind of application is what you learn under something called forensic linguistics, right, using language, the relationship between language and the law, for example. Okay. And then in another very important social context, it's quite the opposite. Instead of using language to conceal our emotions, we are optimally trying to use language to express our emotions, right? So the first case, you are holding back, but in this case, you are letting it all out. Right. So the most common context and, and the context which I have also done a lot of research on is psychological counseling right, or psychotherapy. So this gentleman sit, seated down and his friend beside him, they are both undergoing counseling right, for some kind of such psychological problem. So nowadays, mental health is a big issue because of COVID-19, because of you know, the recent social events. A lot of people are seeking counseling. And in these situations, the client is using language and trying to express his or her true feelings, right? In order for counseling to be effective, you need to try to express your feelings as much as possible. And this is done through language because uh, psychological counseling is the medium of treatment is actually language. So the subject expresses his true feelings, right? So however, as, as some of you may know, or you may not know, this is far from easy. So although in counseling, we are trying to use language to express our emotions, right? A lot of times it's not an easy task. Especially a lot of research has shown that when people are expressing their anxiety towards certain things, they find it very difficult to actually find the right words to express how they feel, right? So take a look at this example. So T stands for therapist. Right? So the therapist is seeing that the client or patient, P for patient, feels very anxious, very nervous about something. And the therapist says, it sounds like you feel pursued by things. And look at the very long response by the patient. Oh God, yeah, well, it's like I'm submerged in them. It's kind of like I've been chasing my, it's like when you see a cat chase its tail around. It's kind of like me trying to get rid of my troubles by catching my tail, right? So I'm not gonna read the whole paragraph, but you see the point. This patient is trying very hard to explain or to describe how he feels in his condition of anxiety, but he finds a lot of, you know, roundabout ways, you know, using metaphors and things like that, try to express himself in the best way possible. And it's not always an easy task. So as a linguist, as a person who studies language or linguistics, so you in future, if you're interested, if you join a program, you know, when you graduate from a program, you are an applied linguist. So how can applied linguist, linguistics or applied linguists help in this kind of situation? Our research is not about grammar, is not about you know what you may think English is about in the secondary school classroom is, is actually quite different, right? So we study applied linguistics. Our program is called Bachelor of Arts in English and Applied Linguistics. So applied linguistics is the scientific study of language use in society. Okay, very broad definition. And psychological counseling is a form of linguistic interaction between therapists and clients. Right, so therapists, when you, when, if you're a client, when you see a therapist, you guys are interacting with the medium of language. You are not drawing pictures. You are not, um, you know, you, you are not behaving in any other way, but you are actually uh, facilitating or the interact, um, the counseling actually unfolds through language and language alone. Okay, so therefore, if we can kind of try to measure how engaged emotionally the clients are during the process of linguistic interaction. In other words, if we can know using science, using applied linguistics, how emotional the client is feeling and how well he or she is expressing his emotions, then we can actually test different strategies of counseling, different interactional strategies and use the best ones to help people express their emotions better. Okay, so this is where we get to how language betrays our emotions. So this is also where we see how the study of language <laughs> involves other fields, for instance, psychophysiology. Well, I heard a strange laughter there. I hope it's <laughs> not something strange. Okay, anyway, so the psychophysiology 
actually is the relationship between psychology, how you feel, and physiology, how your body actually uh, transmits or displays signals of how you are feeling. Okay, so the very so you know we only have a very short time today. Very basically, a very broad summary of how this works is that you may not know, but when you get emotional, your sweat glands, right? The capacity of your body to sweat actually increases slightly. Your sweat glands become more active when you are emotional. Okay, when you're happy or sad or disgusted or you know scared or things like that. So when your sweat glands become more active, right? Your skin actually becomes a better conductor of electricity. Okay, so therefore, when your skin becomes better conductor of electricity, when you supply a voltage across the skin, we can actually use this kind of device you see on the top to pass a very small voltage. It's not going to electrocute you, but it's going to be able to detect the current flow across your skin as a result of your increased uh, ability to conduct electricity. Okay, so this is how we can measure like, emotional engagement. By using this kind of equipment, we can see during counseling the extent to which different ways of talking to the client evoke different levels of emotional engagement. So therefore, we can monitor what is called skin conductance. So the ability of your skin to conduct electricity is called skin conductance. And then test different communication styles or strategies during counseling to see which one works the best. Okay. So how do we do this, right? How, at PolyU, you know, how do researchers like me do this? By what kind of equipment do we use to measure and analyze skin conductance? You see, this is actually, it's actually very basic equipment. If you've seen my YouTube video uh, about this talk, you would have seen this device already, right? So all we need is a pair of silver, silver chloride electrodes. So these are basically just, you see on this person's index finger, the, there are actually two electrodes underneath her index finger, which are actually attached so that uh, it can actually measure the current, current that is flowing through her finger. Okay, and this thing here is a Bluetooth signal receiver as well as a transmitter. So when this uh, device picks up the current, it actually transmits the signal wirelessly to this computer through this receiver, right? So you need a computer and you just need some software for analyzing the signals as you can see. And there we can see literally how the client responses is shown on the screen. So as a linguist, we cannot do mind reading, but we do skin reading. Okay? And this already is something quite uh, probably, as you can see, is quite different from what you may imagine from the traditional so-called English classroom, because studying linguistics is not studying English, it's way beyond that, all right? So I'm gonna play to you a short demonstration video, right? So unfortunately, because of COVID-19, I cannot see you face to face. If I can see you face to face, I can pick one of you to test the device and you can see for yourself how it works. But since I cannot see you face to face, I will show you a short demonstration video of how this thing works. So first we strap the electrodes around the subject's index finger, as you see here. And then we place the receiver of the signal onto the subject's forearm like this. So goodness, the new semester has just begun for you. So some people say that you know, the new semester is like climbing a tall mountain. It's really difficult and challenging. So do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I do agree because it's a transition from high school to college. We then transfer the data onto the computer for separate statistical analysis. Okay, so I hope you can see and hear that. So basically, three very basic steps, right? First, we just attach the um, the, uh, the the electrodes and also the signal receiver onto the subject's forearm, right? And we usually put it on the arm of the non-dominant hand. So if the subject is a left-hander like me, we will put it on the right hand. If the subject is a right-hander, we will put it on the left hand. So, but because this is uh, because we are trying to get the best contact point possible. So we are trying to avoid the hand that the subject uses the most because when you use your hand the most, right, your skin, the conductance uh, 
is not probably as the contact point is not probably as salient or distinct as the other hand, right? And then we start the session. We start to test various ways of you know talking to the to the person, right? And at the same time, as you can see just now on the screen, the client doesn't see it, but we are seeing it, right? We see the signal as it is tracing that emotional engagement as they are talking, right? And then finally, at the end, we analyze the data using the computer, right? So in this way, this is called applied linguistics research. We are researching ways in which using language and the emotional engagement it uh, results in can actually be exploited or tested in different ways with the purpose of benefiting society, in this case, benefiting psychological counselors. So what do we find from, from, from the research I've done over the past few years? So the most important finding I've found is that using figurative language like metaphor, like analogies as a communication strategy is actually very effective in helping people express their emotions. So if you notice in the video, I started by saying the new semester is like a mountain, right? So when you climb a mountain, you feel exhilarated, you feel a great sense of achievement, but it is also a difficult thing to do. So comparing the new semester to a mountain and then asking the client to talk about it in terms of this imagery or in terms of this metaphor actually helps the clients express their feelings better, okay? But it is not so straightforward because I also found that this strategy does not work immediately. It doesn't take effect immediately because as I will show you later from the graph, right, the client actually needs time to settle down and needs time to process this kind of strategy and needs time to respond before the increased emotional engagement takes effect. So as a result of this, as a linguist, based on these findings that we find, we can actually advise counselors. We can actually, in fact, give them training. The conclusion is that therapists or psychologists need linguistic training in order to manage the use of figurative language so that uh, their clients can actually benefit in the long term, okay? So let's take a look uh, more closely at a typical signal. So this is a skin conductance signal. As you can see, the x-axis is the time. So if we talk to the person for eight and a half minutes and beyond, and the y-axis actually is the skin conductance level, right? So the higher it is, the more emotionally engaged the person is. It is measured in micro siemens as the standard international unit, right? So this 0 0.77 is average level across the whole signal, across eight and a half minutes. Right. So you see at the beginning, the first two minutes, actually, the person's conductance actually generally goes down. So do you know why it goes down? It's because this is a period that is called habituation. So we are actually asking the client to relax and not do anything the first two minutes before we start the experiment, because we want the client to start the experiment when he or she is feeling calm and as relaxed as possible. So this is called habituation, getting the client to be habituated to the device and to derive to, to, to be able to get a baseline level. So you can see in this time period, right, the skin conductance gradually goes down to almost zero. And then as the experiment starts, you can see some fluctuations, small fluctuations, but as you can also see, gradually there is a general trend of increase. So there are small fluctuations of going up and down. This is very common because the client is speaking about very different things in her life. But then as time goes on, as the communication strategy takes effect, right? I said just now that the strategy needs time to take effect. So as the strategy takes effect, the signal gradually rises more and more and more, and also with more fluctuations. So this is a good sign that the client is not only engaging more and more emotionally, but also taking part in the counseling more and more easily and um, smoothly, right? With more and more fluctuations and a gradual increase. Okay, so at PolyU, we also teach you not just to analyze uh, language or to analyze this kind of graph, we actually combine them. So again, this is just a graph to show you the kind of results that we found in our research, right? So the red line is actually what we call the literal style. So the literal style means the counselor doesn't use any special strategy, doesn't use the figurative language strategy, right? And the blue line is the metaphorical style, where the, where the counselor uses the metaphorical uh, strategy that I talked about just now, right? So as you can see from this very simple graph, time period from one to three, that means as time goes on, you can see that 
the blue line increases much at a much higher rate and the red line increases quite slowly. So this graph already tells us that the metaphorical style is better in engaging clients' emotions, right? So we also analyze the language so we can see this counseling was conducted in Chinese, but we also translated to English. So you can see for yourself in the literal style, in the metaphorical style, we show these kinds of data to students and then we ask, we teach them how to analyze the language that is used. For instance, in this case, you can see using literal style, the patient finds it very difficult to explain the question, which is, can you usually fully understand what you read? So in this case, the counselor is talking to the patient about his or her academic problems, right? So he's asking the, the patient, when you read things in university, can you usually fully understand it? So the patient says something with some effort. Whereas in this style, you notice the uh, counselor uses a very interesting metaphor. In Chinese, it's zhi tou. That means, you know, in English, it's, it's like eat through. It doesn't make sense in English, but in the original Chinese, this is like a metaphor. And then because of this kind of very interesting expression, you can see for yourself that uh, the subsequent interaction is much more productive because they are discussing much more easily. Okay, and this kind of data is reflected in this kind of uh, statistical trend that we can analyze. So starting applied linguistics, right, you learn not just about analyzing language, but you also learn things like, you know, psychology and experimentation and things like that, all with an eye on application to benefit society. Okay, so actually we only have half an hour today. So this is um, the main point that I want to convey to you today. These are the main conclusions you can draw from this kind of uh, study, from this kind of research which is that, yes, language betrays our emotions. So the word betrays sounds as if it's a bad thing. It sounds as if you know the language is doing something wrong to us. But as you can see in the context of psychotherapy, by using applied linguistics or language sciences, we are actually making use of this fact in order to benefit the counselors and the clients and ultimately benefiting society. So precisely because when we speak, right, our emotions are actually fully enacted and measurable. And therefore, because of this, Right, we can measure the emotions and then we can use it to test scientific hypotheses in order to derive the best kind of strategy to help counselors in their work, which is very important work in today's world, not just in Hong Kong, but around the world. Okay, And also the study of language in university is interdisciplinary. So this means that when you learn applied linguistics, it not, it's not just linguistics, you also learn a bit about other fields. Like in my talk, I showed you some other some knowledge from other fields like psychology, physiology, statistics, and things like that. And it's all connected very closely. And, and of course, this is ultimately to the benefit of students who study with us. Okay. So that brings us to the end of, of this very short, I, I really wish I had more time with you guys, where maybe I can demonstrate the device in more detail. But unfortunately, we got to make the best use of the limited time. And we also want to leave some time for you to ask questions. So let me end by also telling a bit about our Bachelor of Arts program in PolyU in the Department of English, right? So the, our undergraduate degree program is called BAEAL, um, sorry, Bachelor of Arts in English and Applied Linguistics. As you can see, this is our, our departmental program website. There's a lot of information here. And we are trying to train students to excel, not just in English, but also to become a highly effective professional communicator, right? So when you join us, right, not only are you learning very interesting things, but you're also in the company of some top class researchers. As you know, Paul Liu has done very well in the most recent QS World University rankings. It's 75th, but our linguistics is even stronger than that. Our linguistics, right, which the Department of English belongs to, right, which uh, this program, our program belongs to, is actually ranked 45th, not in Asia, but in the whole world. So our linguistics ranking is actually higher than the rest, the ranking of the rest of the university, right? So therefore, when you join us, you are definitely in excellent hands. You are learning the most cutting edge things and the latest knowledge. Okay, and finally, before we uh, stop to entertain some questions you may have about the talk and about the program, let me just tell you about the upcoming workshops under this theme, right? So I, I was the first speaker. My name is uh, Dennis Tay. The next speaker is my colleague, Renia Lopez in November, as you can see, followed by my colleague, Dr. Phoebe Lin in December. They're also gonna talk about how applied linguistics can benefit society 
in, in different ways. So you see, we have a wide range of expertise. But Renia is going to talk about the link between your ideas, your hands, and your speech. And Phoebe is going to talk about smart living with language technology. So we warmly welcome all secondary four to six students, right? And more information about registration can be found on our website. And later on, Catherine Law, our marketing manager, will also tell you more about how to register for uh, these upcoming events. So please check out uh, these events. We really want you to join us and to learn more about linguistics and about our undergraduate program. So that is all from me. Thank you very much for your very um, brief, unfortunately brief attention. We only have 30 minutes. So now we have time for any questions that you may have, right?